Jeff DeBelko is Director of Environmental Studies for the Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs at Ohio University and also serves as a Senior Consultant for the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Wilson Center. Hi, Jeff. Welcome back. Thank you very much, son. Not long ago when we would talk about climate change, we uh -huh. would talk about it as something in the future, if not the distant future, a distant threat. And now the tone of the conversation has changed. Now people are saying the effects are here now. Uh, the, the spate of recent reports have had a singular theme, which is climate change is now and no one's immune. So it is not something in the future that is slow and uh, that our kids will worry about. It's something that we're seeing the effects of right now. And I want to, as we segue into a discussion of this new report, uh, I want to get some general thoughts on you about how climate change relates to national security. We don't necessarily think of it as a national security issue. Mm -hmm. And we really only have in, say, the last seven or eight years. And it's one that has multiple dimensions. It has implications of what it means for our traditional security institutions. So what does it mean for the roles of the military and those traditional security institutions. But it also is a conversation about what it means for human security, individual security, uh, because it has big health effects, big economic effects, affects our food supply and water. And so um, in some ways, no matter how you define security, there are linkages that are um, present and ones that we really need to take seriously. And so people are thinking of security generally in terms of military action or terrorism. But what we're talking about here is instability brought on by uh, climate impact and how this then creates a, a domino effect where when there's instability, there are often challenges for security. Yeah, that's right. And it's in, you highlight the, a key theme, which is it's complex. Mm -hmm. And it matters where we're talking about, and it can manifest in different ways. Um, and so it is um, a challenge to then take these issues seriously in, in places as diverse as the Arctic, in sub-Saharan Africa, and here in the coast of the United States, um, where there are high vulnerabilities in many respects of populations, of infrastructure, communities, um, and there are ways to respond, but in, in some cases, because we haven't been responding um, and haven't integrated this additional challenge into what are also already some big challenges, um, that they're rising to the level of security concerns. So this report, the Center for Naval Analysis Military Advisory Board, a very impressive roster of retired military personnel mm -hmm. uh, heading up. What, what is the significance of this? What is the report focusing on? Well, this is the second time CNA has gotten a, a, a senior level, very senior level military leaders. Uh, together to take a look at climate change and understand what it means for security. Not to be climate scientists, which they are not, but to be national security leaders and look at this issue through their lens. And in some ways, their tools um, are familiar in applying climate change. They need to understand about uh, uncertain threats that could have multiple outcomes, and you need to plan for unknown probability, but potentially really high negative outcomes. And so in that kind of, um, through that lens, they are finding that what we know about climate and what we anticipate about climate change are issues that um, in different regions of the world and in different ways pose challenges for our civilian leadership. Uh, and they make statements about where, how we need to have serious leadership on the international level as well as on the domestic level. Um, and then also implications of what it means for roles, responsibilities, missions, uh, for the military and traditional security institutions. And they did this back in 2007 and, and feel that enough has changed that they need to do an update. So what are some of the major findings that, that they identify? Well, I, I think they uh, reiterate this theme that this is not a future issue, it's a today issue, that it uh, plays out in different ways in different places, but that it, it is um, relevant to talk about all places having some impacts, um, that it is uh, critical for the U.S., proper. Um, so many times this discussion was looking at highly vulnerable poor countries overseas. And it Island was seen. Nations, that, things like that. Exactly. And it was seen that wealth would kind of um, metaphorically, you could build a higher seawall and keep these problems at bay. Um, but they're finding that uh, a look at critical infrastructure in the United States and coastal infrastructure is absolutely necessary because of the threats, I suppose. Um, that there are parts of the world that we haven't prioritized and don't have capabilities to be present in such as the Arctic, where these changes are happening very rapidly. Um, that it is a, uh, a set of challenges that at the combatant command or down into the military structure that those, um, those leaders need to integrate these issues into their 
day-to-day -day planning and considerations and preparations for potential roles. Those could be humanitarian roles. Those could be responding to um, instability. Again, not instability that climate change causes on its own, but some of these places, in fact, where they're already operating, these, these are additional sources of stress mm -hmm. that could uh, really pose challenges. And for those of you interested, I should let you know that you can come to the environmental change and security portion of the Wilson Center uh, program uh, website, and you can find the full report. You can find a, a panel discussion, including many of the participants in the report. In the time we have remaining here, Jeff, I'd like to mention a couple of the recommendations and have you very briefly comment on, mm -hmm. on a few of them. We can't cover all of them. One is this notion that the United States should take a, a leadership role. When you look at the politics of this, are we in a position to take a leadership role? Well, I think we are. Um, and I, at the same time, I think you're right, we're challenged to, to do that. Um, but I think one of the ways is to fall back on the tradition of where the United States has exhibited environmental leadership in the past, and it's been at local and state levels, and the innovation and the action has come there. That's where the problems are playing out, and that's where the policy innovations, the technology innovations come. It's too bad that often the, the national level is a follower rather than a leader in this, but at the same time, we do have examples of leadership that is not necessarily going through Congress, but coming from the executive branch. And we need to recognize those as significant, but find a way to pull them together in a broader national strategy. And that's starting to happen, but we have a long long way to go, particularly as we then translate that on the international stage. Another recommendation involves this so-called nexus uh, of water, food, energy. Mm -hmm. And the recommendation is that all planning should consider that nexus. This is really where rubber meets the road, how people live and, and their daily lives can be affected. It is. and so. Typically, we just look within one of those sectors. So you'd have a food assessment, a water assessment, um, an energy assessment, but not the integration. And so much of what's behind energy has a water footprint. And so much behind your agriculture is certainly connected to your water. And so we aren't particularly good or um, incentivized to look at these things together. But it's the synergies and the interactions and ones that often prove quite challenging um, that climate change is going to exacerbate and play a role in. So we need to look at the three together. Can this report have an impact? Will people pay attention? I think so. If the last one is any um, uh, indicator, uh, it played a big role in drawing a wider set of, of eyes to the problem and, and, and decision makers as well as a broader public. Um, it is one that is important who's saying it. Um, and in some ways, because it's from a, a less expected audience, uh, flagging this as a priority can have more impact. Um, it is uh, what maybe a necessary but in no way sufficient step but one that hopefully multiple constituencies can build upon. Final question, Jeff, is uh, around when is too late too late? You've heard mm -hmm. a lot of talk now about the fact that the train has left the station in some regards. Uh, big chunks of polar ice caps are starting to break off. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by that? And it, it's, it, it might suggest a certain hopelessness or helplessness. Right. What do we mean right. by that? Well, I think we are currently experiencing and in for even bigger changes. Um, and in that sense, it's not too late, uh, or it's only too late if we think things are going to stay the same and what we've been used to in the past is what we'll have in the future. Um, it, but it shouldn't be the message that we just kind of throw our hands up and, and give up. There, we haven't really uh, seriously begun to figure out how to systematically try to adapt to these changes. At the same time, we're trying to slow the problems, to mitigate the problems. Um, so. In some ways, you'd say, well, let's try a little bit harder before we say it's, it's too late and, and put the resources, the time and, and attention and the tremendous innovation that we can bring to this uh, before we give up on it. But it is a, it is a call for standby for heavy seas because changes are coming. Well, Jeff, you have been in the forefront of these discussions, and thanks for leading the way. And uh, this is a story that won't be going away. We'll be talking about this for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John.